Hello and welcome to Million Dollar Monday. I'm your host, Greg Mazzello, bringing you real successful people with real useful advice for people with big dreams. I understand big dreams. I turned an investment of $200 and a lot of great advice from some really successful people into my big dream, Pro Forma, that today is a half billion dollar company. Well, hello and welcome. You know, today I have another first for Million Dollar Monday, and my guest today was on Jeopardy with Alex Trebek, and we're going to hear how he did uh, in a few minutes. He's also a Forbes 30 Under 30 award-winning entrepreneur. He is the co-founder and co-CEO of a business called Apple Cart, that is a platform that has raised $12.5 billion in funding and has cumulative revenues well over $30 million that does some really cool things in helping advertisers reach high value business decision makers. Welcome, Sasha. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for being on the, on the show here with us. Really appreciate it. So, okay, before we get going with the business stuff, I just got to know, how did you do on Jeopardy? Uh, so I won a game. I, I uh, beat a five-day champion. I sort of got up there and figured when I found out I was going up against a five-day champion that that was the end of that. My uh, Jeopardy aspirations have gone right out the window, but it turns out all parts of the game are equally important. Uh, answering the questions on the one hand and wagering correctly on the other hand. And I actually oh. ended up winning at the end of the day on Final Jeopardy on the wager. Uh, multiple people got the question right, uh, but not everyone wagered correctly. And I ended up with the highest score. So I walked away a winner. All right. How much did you win? About 20 grand. And what'd you do with it? Uh, well, it was right after I graduated from college. Right. So, so most of it went straight into my bank account and right. uh, you know, a small chunk of it went to buy my now wife her engagement ring. Uh, that's so romantic. It's a great story. So I know that when you were in school, I think you were a congressional page. And I know that during and after school, you got involved in a few campaigns. Tell us about that and those experiences. And then some of the background thinking then that led to two guys in a dorm room starting a business. Sure. So I had, um, you know, as a, like, I like to joke, the, uh, you know, the defective political gene from a very early age, did a lot of campaign work you know, as, a, as a 12-year-old or 13-year-old, 14-year-old, something I was really engaged in okay. where I grew up. Um, and by the time I was you know, 19 or 20 and in college, I had worked on a presidential campaign at, at, at a fairly high level in 2012. I had uh, seen sort of up close and personally you know, there's there's the political aspect of politics in the form of candidates and policy. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, there's sort of the business of political campaigns. These are sort of very large machines that attract a lot of money and that spend that money very quickly. Uh, and so there's this whole operational aspect to how these things work as machines. And that's really sort of the, the shared set of experiences that I had with Matt. And so when we were introduced by uh, your professor, uh, who we were both working as research assistants for over you know, the summer after our freshman year, he introduced us and he said, you know, you guys are either going to become best friends or you're going to kill each other, but you're definitely going to bond. You've had some similar experiences. Uh, you know, and I'm excited to see sort of what comes of that. Uh, and uh, you know, so we, we ultimately did bond over a very similar set of experiences, sort of seeing people we liked raise lots of money and have real difficulty translating it into success. So, you're going to have to explain to me, really, how your platform helps reach high value business decision makers or political type decision makers or voters. Explain the thinking that went around creating a business that today people know as Apple Cart. Sure. Uh, so I think the big insight for us was that you know, most people make decisions in context, and that may be context of things they've seen on television or read in the news, uh, but it's equally likely, if not more likely, that that context comes from people that they know. That might be family members in some contexts, might be friends in others, it might be business associates or former classmates or something like that. 
But these are the people who you're likely to rely on when you're trying to answer a question you don't already know the answer to. And so that sort of insight is where we started, you know, that if you want to influence someone's decision, it would be great if you could get in front of the people that they know and are likely to ask for advice. And so you know, okay. we started out thinking about that in a political context, but the core of what we do is we basically make it possible for someone to advertise to a decision maker they care about and to a specific group of individuals that are known to that decision maker and known by that decision maker uh, at, at our client's requests. So that may be you know, former colleagues of the decision maker or current colleagues or, or business school classmates from 20 years ago. Uh, you know, and our goal is to help our clients get their content in front of not just the decision maker, but the people they might reasonably ask questions. Can you give us a real life example of, of how this has worked in the marketplace? Sure. Um, so, so to give you a sales example. Yeah. Uh, so oftentimes people are selling to other businesses. It's a much more complicated sale than you know, selling a mattress to a consumer where yeah. you don't necessarily care who particularly buys that next mattress as long as you're hitting your numbers. You know, in a business to business context, it's very different. You know, you're trying to hit a very specific person at a very specific company. And that's really where we come in is we're able to supplement what a sales team would do in person with paid content in a really efficient way. So to give you a concrete example, please, uh, let's imagine you're selling, you're leasing commercial real estate here in New York City for office space. And you have fantastic, beautiful real estate and you want to go to a major investment bank. And when you meet with them in person, the first thing you do is you pull out your book of the space you just built out for one of their biggest competitors. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Should be really attractive to young new hires. And you want to show this to them. Why? Because you want to show them what they're missing out on. And you want them to see, you know, there's some real benefit potentially to leasing with you as opposed to one of the many other places they could go. So that's what you do in person. Until we came along, it really wasn't possible to supplement that with paid marketing beforehand, such that maybe the person you're meeting with would actually have heard this idea, you know, customized to them before you ever walk into the room to have that sales meeting. And that's where people use us specifically on sales related questions, but they use us on a variety of other communications related problems as well. Everything is varied from you know, dealing with equity researchers to regulators to legislators to uh, you know, reporters and media sources and things like that. So we're, we're used across a whole suite of communications needs beyond just sales. So part of the theory is if I'm looking to buy something or lease something or whatever it might be, I might be talking to people I know who I might trust their judgment or, uh, or their opinion. Uh, and, and so you're, you want to educate people I might be talking to so that if I do ask them, uh, maybe they would say, oh, yeah, I've heard of them uh, or have you heard of and uh, that kind of a conversation. That's exactly right. We think yeah. word of mouth is the most powerful form of advertising, uh, but it's really difficult to sort of seed that word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And that's where we come in and are really helpful. Are you able to tell people like, let's say somebody wanted to target um, HR directors and businesses over a certain size. Do you also have that information as to names, titles, and contact information? So are you also able to help people source marketing data like that, even marketing contact information? We do have that information. I should be very clear about the fact that we collect a ton of information, but we don't sell the underlying data. We don't just hand out names and addresses of ah, people. Okay. We can make it addressable for you. We can put it into the online advertising ecosystem so that when you buy your Facebook ads or your LinkedIn ads or your display ads, we're a button you can press and we're a targeting option for it. you. So you go from a great idea two freshmen meet in college. How does this become a real business that gets incorporated, that gets funded, that gets customers? You know, for us to start, uh, I think we probably went about a year before we incorporated, where we were really just road testing the idea. Obviously, the particulars of the implementation we originally had in mind for political campaigns were totally different than the kind of work we do today. Same underlying data, 
very different approach. Um, but, you know, first we were trying to make sure that we had something resembling, you know, market fit. We, we had interest. Uh, and that's sort of where we started. Once we realized mm-hmm. that, you know, our terrible 45 minute long description of what we can now describe in about 45 seconds uh, was getting, you know, perking up some ears and getting some interest. That's really when we started to investigate sort of where do we go about finding you know, legal assistance to help us incorporate, to help figure out some of these things, you know, set up uh, bank accounts, you know, all kinds of other stuff that we had. We had literally no context for. Did you talk to some people that told you that's just a terrible idea? Family? We friends? talked to a lot of people that told us it was a terrible idea. And honestly, you know, one of the one of my business role models is my mother. Um, she's one of the best business women I know. And one of her early pieces of advice to me, not about business, actually about dating of all things, was you should count the number of no's you get, not the number of yeses. If you target 100 no's, you will get the yeses you're looking for. Uh, and you won't be as disappointed when you don't get a yes every time. And I think that that was good, uh, good logic for dating and great logic for business. Absolutely. So you're up and running. I think I read that your first customers, a couple of customers were more in the political world, which is where you thought you would play. And then you found out there might be some business applications. At what point were you able to have a fundraising round? So, you know, it's funny when we got started to your point earlier, um, we got lots of no's, including from investors. Literally every investor we met with was a no because they didn't understand the market we were originally targeting. The political market is an odd business for sure. Uh, And uh, what we realized through that process was we knew more about our market than anyone we were asking for money did. So it wasn't really that surprising that we weren't super exciting to them because we understood things they did. not And I guess if they had understood those things, they might very well have started our business before we did. Um, So it was through the work we originally were doing in politics, we ended up meeting a lot of business executives because as you can imagine, we would get wheeled into these, these fundraising meetings and people, you know, the candidates would introduce us, you know, look at my startup guys with their, their hoodies and their jeans and their data and their technology. Let them tell you about their, you know, pointy eared Spock like approach to, to how we're going to run this campaign. Um, and so we ended up, you know, under promising and over delivering. And you know, before we knew it, we had these business leaders come to us and say, you know, gosh, have you guys ever thought about doing this for companies? You know, mm-hmm. we don't go out of business every two years, even when we succeed. Uh, and so it took us a while to, to figure that out because while it was flattering, uh, you know, we were both Matt and I, you know, middle class kids, neither one of us was funding our company out of personal money or anything like that. It was our Literally, it was our bar mitzvah funds that we invested in this thing at the beginning. We cleaned our entire bank accounts out, a couple thousand bucks a piece. Uh, right. um, and so you know, we were you know, college seniors by this point. We had a business that was generating real revenue. And the last thing we were about to do was, was sort of take the Silicon Valley approach of blowing up a good thing to potentially build a much bigger good thing. Um, so it took a couple of years, honestly, for us to find the right investment partner. And, you know, in truth, it's the very best thing that happened to us. The best possible thing that happened to us is that we weren't able to raise money early because there are a lot of problems that come with raising money when you're not really ready to spend it, know exactly what you want to do with it. And, you know, we eventually found uh, the ideal set of partners who understood the business we were coming from and the business we wanted to build. And at that point, it made sense to raise outside money. How'd you find them? Uh, you know, again, it was it was a networking thing. Funnily enough, um, you know, one of our lead investors was the brother of a professor of ours uh, who reconnected with me because he saw me on Jeopardy. So, you you know, small know. world phenomenon. You never, you never know where you're going to find that. That's exactly right. Which sort of, in a unique way, proves your business concept altogether, right? It's who you know and how they know you and how you connect with them that at the end of the day can provide massive results. That's, that's, that's certainly been my take. Every, every yeah. step along the way, the core premise has just been reinforced, which is that yeah. figuring out how to you know, introduce yourself to new people and meet their people is, is the entire name of the game. I love it. I love it. Did, they, did you get one fundraising round of $12.5 or did it come in a few uh, tranches? 
That's a great question. So it came in a couple tranches. We raised okay. um, you know, about $2 million on a convertible note. And then the rest of it came in in our first proper fundraising round that was you know, a price equity round. Tell me uh, one or two of the biggest mistakes, and then I'll ask about a couple of things that you've done right. But what are one or two of the biggest mistakes that you made and what lessons can our listeners learn from them? Sure. Um, so, number of different mistakes. I think I think I'll focus on two because uh, I like to think that we make lots of mistakes once and don't repeat very many of them. The first one is uh, biting off more than you can chew. Now, you can't grow a business without biting off more than you can chew, but you need to have a plan for how you're going to cut things out into bite-sized pieces that can be chewed. Otherwise, you're very quickly going to find yourself choking on pieces that are too large. Um, the second, you know, I think there's a bit of crackerjack wisdom, especially that comes out of sort of technology startup world, you know, hire fast and fire fast. Um, personally, I think it's the dumbest advice I've ever heard. You know, we, every time we've hired fast, it's, it's, it's been a mistake. And what I mean by that is, you know, growth at any cost is not the priority. You want to grow your team in a sustainable, intelligent way. And if you have A-plus people on your team, sometimes it's hard to find more A-plus people, and that's okay. But we've always been better off keeping a role open and looking for that A-plus person who's a perfect fit rather than rushing to fill it because you know, we have a need, we have clients that have needs, or we're growing, things are breaking. Um, so I would say you know, pretty consistently, you know, when you start off you know, hiring, 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 there's so much to learn about how to find the right people. Building a great team is tough. Destroying it tough. is really easy. Really, all easy. you need to do is bring one bad egg into you know into the environment, and that could ruin a whole environment for a lot of other people. Right, right. Well, so would, are you hire slow, fire fast, or hire slow and be patient with your decision? Uh, I'm more hire slow, fire fast. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because. Um, you're, as you said, one rotten apple can have a, a, a massive impact on, on the bunch. However, hiring a lot of people and getting rid of a lot of people because hiring fast has to result in firing a lot of people fast can really play havoc on the mentality of everybody not knowing who's next. Um, and the and other thing I would say on that yeah. is, is, is just that you know, people are still people. And despite the fact that they might not be a fit for your enterprise, that doesn't make them bad people necessarily. No, of at least. Not. most of them are great people and so we've really gone out of our way over the years when we have to make a change to do whatever we can to find that person uh, you know, a new opportunity that's a better fit for them good because for it's just about yeah. fit at the end of the day yeah 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 good for you and uh, uh that's a really good move all right one or two of the things that you did the best some of the smartest decisions and uh what can our listeners learn from that so I think, you know, in terms of best, um, great piece of advice that I got that has proven itself right is start out with something that you're passionate about. Uh, relatively few people are passionate about business. There are a lot of people who are passionate about politics or marketing or medicine or, or uh, 101 other things you could be passionate about. But if you start with your passion and try to figure out how can I monetize my passion, that's the right way to think about things. Uh, because yeah. if you know, you may not get it right the first time or the second time or the 10th time, but if you think about it through that lens, it'll keep exciting you and it'll keep mm -hmm. pushing you to, to, to try new things. And eventually you're likely to come up with a way to you know, work on things that really fulfill you and, and excite you uh, because, you know, we wouldn't call it work if, if it was something everyone wanted to do all day long. There, there are parts of work that are mm -hmm. not appealing. Uh, and, and it's really important that you motivate yourself by finding stuff you want to do that you're genuinely interested in, excited mm -hmm. about if you're planning on starting your own business. Yeah. I'll bet you, given your passion, given your level of excitement and two partners sharing that passion, I'll bet you there were things because of your passion. I'm a big believer in the law of attraction. I'll bet there are things that fell in your lap almost that like things that came out of the clear blue opportunities or uh, introductions or whatever have you because of that excitement. Um, good things happen when you're just in a positive framework and uh, 
of course, not such good things happen to people that are just constantly negative. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And I think that the sort of the second piece of advice I'd give from my own personal experience is um, you know, business partners are important. Like the fact that I started my business with my best friend and we had a strong relationship before we ever started talking about dollars and cents made it possible for us yeah. to get through some pretty high highs together, which has been a lot of fun, but also some pretty low lows because starting a business is a roller coaster. Not every day is going to be fun. And some problems, you know, making, making, making ends meet, making budgets balance, um, you know, can be complicated and can be fraught. And so if you start with a really strong relationship uh, you know, with, with your business partners and uh, some kind of division of labor, it's a lot easier to work through tough problems trusting yeah. each other from the perspective of you know, goals and aspirations and motivations because yeah. you know each other as people first. Yeah. Well, partnerships have to be almost like a marriage for better, for worse. Right. And uh, the other part has to be equally sharing the yoke, if you will, because I think if one partner ever gets to the point, they feel that they're contributing way more than the other. Uh, and, and there's an unfair distribution of, money compared to distribution of the work, uh, that's a big challenge. So I'm sure that you guys both feel very, because I heard you talk about division of, of the work and the cho chores and what have you, that I'm, I'm sure that that happens also. There's definitely a division of labor. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I tend to think that if Matt didn't have me in this business, he probably would have done 99% of the good things that we've done and vice versa. I tend to think if I didn't yeah. have Matt, I would have been able to do most of the good things. But there are a lot of mistakes we didn't make because we were checks on each other that yeah. if one of us wasn't here or the other one wasn't here, could have crippled business and put us out of business many times along the way. Yeah. And so I think about it as, uh, you know, how do you go faster and reduce yeah. mistakes, you know, have yeah, strong yeah, yeah. partnerships? Well, listen, you're a brilliant young man. I'm sure your partner is a brilliant partner. You've got a brilliant business plan. I thank you for answering some of my questions because I didn't even quite understand it, but now I do. And I, I further understand why you and your business has been recognized by Bloomberg and Business Week and the Washington Post, the Associated Press, USA Today and Politico. You're just on the you're on really a great path with a unique business model that really the more people learn about it, the more applicability and success you will have. Thank you for joining me, Sasha. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Greg.